Let me tell you uh, yep. a little bit about who I am uh, so that I, I'm not depending solely on my American a accent to be convincing. Um, <clears throat> I started uh, programming. I graduated in 91. I went to work at Microsoft in Redmond. I worked on the Excel team. I was a programmer for a long time. I moved to New York. When I got to New York, I sort of bounced around a couple of different programming jobs. And every time I met another programmer, our conversation would always be, have you found any good programming jobs in New York? And there was a gigantic paradox which was that nobody I knew that was a programmer could think of any good programming jobs in New York. And nevertheless, all the recruiters at all the tech companies in New York and all the startups were all saying it's impossible to find programmers. We can't find any programmers. And essentially, I realized that it came down to the fact that nobody was making a great environment the programmers wanted to work in. There were, despite the enormous shortage of uh, talent, of technical talent, of programming talent, uh, the environments, the working environments, uh, were miserable. And um, so that's what I started blogging about. And I started writing a blog called Joel on Software in the year 2000. Some of you may have seen it. And I started writing about ways to make the work environment better, ways to um, develop software better, just ways to be a little bit more, more sane about this stuff. Um, I started a company called Fog Creek Software. And we didn't even have an idea at Fog Creek for what our product would be well, when we started. It was me and Michael Pryor, um, started this company and we said, we don't know, we're going to make a company that good developers want to work at. And somehow, if we can make a company that good developers want to work at, the good developers will come and they'll come up with things and we'll make great products, which indeed we have um, products like Fogbugs and, and Trello over the years. Um, in 2008, I started another company. Uh, the original website was called Stack Overflow. The company is called Stack Exchange. Stack Overflow is where all programmers get the answers to all of their programming questions. And uh, my job at both companies and, and most of your jobs is being the human recruiting officer or whatever uh, and, uh, and, and, and trying to attract people to, to, to work at these companies. So I recently asked a question on Twitter uh, just to amuse myself last summer. I said, programmers, what things do recruiters do that drive you crazy? Um, and the, the reason I asked this, I'll come back to this in a second, is that I think that the, uh, um, I'm, I'm not a big believer in personality tests. Um, but I do think that there is a big, big difference in the way that recruiters work from the way that programmers work. And um, if you don't recognize this, you're not aware of this, uh, it creates all kinds of interesting and strange um, conflicts. Uh, in general, recruiters are a little bit more like salespeople. They're people people. They like people. They, they don't mind calling people on the phone. Programmers are almost universally afraid of the telephone. <laughs> I, I certainly am. I can't even call to make an appointment. Um, Recruiters don't mind a lot of ambiguity. They don't mind if something is 30% certain or 50% certain or I think that some of these people will like this job. Uh, programmers want everything to be 100% you know, exactly accurate and precise. Um, recruiters are generally competitive and ambitious. The people that work in recruiting departments are happy to do little competitions to see who can bring the most people in the door. Um, they're motivated by commissions often. A lot of people uh, you know, will work on a bonus uh, type system uh, in recruiting. Um, programmers are not super competitive. Uh, if you were to get two programmers from competing companies like, you know, I don't know, Yahoo and, 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 and Google to sit down, the first thing they would do is tell each other all of their trade secrets. <laughs> Just if they happen to be sitting next to each other on the plane. Um, because it's, you know, in the spirit of sharing and open source and all that kind of stuff. They're just very friendly people. Um, one of the reasons that they code in the first place and the reason they got into programming, for the most part, uh, it's not because it's a good career or because somebody told them that they should major in it. They, they got into programming because computers are very, very predictable. And they're extremely highly 100%. They just do as they're told, uh, which is the exact opposite of humans. And if you think of somebody that is having, let's say, not so much success with unpredictable humans, and then, and then um, being a little bit mean here, and then... Uh, <laughs> and then put them in front of a computer and they suddenly discover that the computer does everything that they want. And if they, if they happen to like that, that describes a particular personality type, right? Um, another thing about programmers is thinking about the, 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 just the day-to-day -day work. They get in the zone, they'll say, or they're in flow, which means that almost all of their productive work is done in these little four-hour bouts of intense concentration in which they tune out the entire rest of the world and they don't even notice the time elapsing and they suddenly look up and it's 8 p.m and they have written three, works, three weeks worth of code. And um, this has been studied, and, and this particular mode of flow or being in the zone uh, is when developers get all their work done, um, but it's very, very easy to knock a developer out of the zone. If you make a little bit of noise or there's an interruption or something else interesting is going on, 
uh, they will leave the zone and they will cease to be productive until about three days later. Uh, and so programmers, among other things, need quiet working conditions and private offices or, or private rooms or the, just the ability, uh, what, what, whatever it is, not headphones playing loud music because that doesn't work either, um, but really quiet, concentrating type environments. And recruiters, it's quite the opposite, that no point do they actually have to sit and concentrate on something at the level that programmers do. Programmers have to keep as many things as they can in their short-term memory. They're more efficient if they have a lot of stuff in short-term memory. And if you've ever tried to remember you know, a 27-digit phone number because you're calling Dubai using a credit card or something, uh, you, know, you know what I mean. And that's the state that you have to be in all the time. If you can get in that state, you can program very, very quickly. Uh, programmers hate the telephone. We talked about that. Um, if you're a recruiter, in most cases, you would be actually a bad programmer, and vice versa, by the way, although some people do switch careers. And uh, programmers don't like you <laughs> uh, because you may not realize that, because you may not be aware of just what all these differences are. I, I always think of uh, kind of a lot of things that recruiters do are the kinds of things that made them people people, that made them socially successful in school, for example. Uh, and programmers were not so socially successful in school. I hate to resort to stereotypes now. And so a lot of times if a recruiter sort of presents themselves to a programmer um, using the techniques that were very successful at making them socially popular in high school, uh, it's actually, it actually has the reverse effect on, on the programmer. Um, so this was my Twitter question. I said, programmers, what do recruiters do that, that drive you crazy? I got about 80,000 programmer followers on the Twitter. And I probably broke Twitter, <laughs> this crash Twitter, just asking this question. Um, exist. <laughs> Contact me, that's pretty bad. Um, use the phone, especially after I already ignored their email. Calling me on a cell phone at a work day during work hours, or at all. Uh, forget that they called me five minutes ago. <laughs> and Eric wrote a blog post about this. This is the developer of the C Sharp programming language, if you don't know who Eric Lippert is. Um, Excessive buzzwords, spelling grammar mistakes, not saying what company role they're recruiting for, setting up phone calls. Okay, there's a lot of stuff here. The phone seems to be kind of, kind of representative. And what was interesting is when you drill down, you actually discover that the entire culture of the way that recruiters are dealing with programmers is, um, is not super successful. Um, so a little story I want to tell here about the steak dinner. Um, when I, uh, oops, doop, 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 steak dinner. Uh, when I uh, started working at Microsoft in the 90s, there was a standard recruiting procedure for out-of-town um, college students. They would fly in to Redmond, Washington, and they'd put them up in the Microsoft Hotel. It was some hotel that Microsoft owned, I think. And um, you would do a whole day of interviews. So it was usually six, I think, three in the morning, maybe three in the afternoon. Um, and then that night, they would take you out to a nice steak dinner at the Black Angus Steakhouse in Redmond, Washington, which was just your cheesy suburban steakhouse. And this sounds like a nice thing, I, I, you, one would think, right? And so they would be pairing up programmers from the company with programmers, often programmers that you know, went to the same school or had something in common, and they would send them off to a steak dinner, all paid for by the company, and that sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Like a great way to seal the deal, to clinch the deal. Uh, these steak dinners, somebody finally figured out 10 years into doing this that these steak dinners were miserable and awkward and silent <laughs> because two programmers that don't know each other that are told to go have a steak dinner and sit at some restaurant following the restaurant script where, you know, would you like a drink? And then you gotta read the menu and that thing takes, off, takes quite a while. Um, that's just gonna be the most awkward thing imaginable and nobody wants to be there and then they go home right away. And so the recruiting department somehow thought that this was this great benefit that you get a free steak or something or that you get this wonderful steak dinner. And actually it was, uh, it was uh, excruciating to all the participants. Um, so they eventually stopped doing them. Uh, the solution to all these pro problems, and the reason that I spend my time working at Stack Overflow Careers on making recruiting better, and the reason that I come and talk to recruiters as often as uh, I'm allowed, is, um, is that the solution to these problems is not, is, involves basically re recruiters kind of turning inwards. And so in your position, if you're going to try to claw programmers out of the earth and somehow persuade them to come work for your company, you are in many cases working against gravity. You are fighting, it, and it feels that way, right? Because it feels like it's really, really hard, and you have to get 10 programmers this year, and you only got four. And, um, and, and you do literally feel like you don't have the tools that you need, and, and, and you're using your, your, your nails to dig in the hard earth uh, to try to find a programmer or two, and they're not very good, and, and it takes forever to try to persuade them to come work for you. Um, the, the real problem is actually, let's flip it around, make gravity work for you, 
the real problem is how to create an environment that the programmers want to work in. How to make a company that, or a corporation or an organization that programmers are excited about working for and want to work for. And what are those things? And so that's really the, the, what I spend a lot of my time talking about, which is what programmers are looking for. Because if you can't provide these things, then just go hire Accenture. Not that Accenture provides these things, but whatever. Get you. I mean, you're going to have to outsource programming if your organization is not, wants to hire programmers and cannot make an environment that good programmers want to work in, because obviously they have choices, um, unless they live in Italy. OK, so here's a, few of, here's a few of the things that, I mean, we do surveys all the time on this. We put this data out every year. Um, you can find a bunch of it on the Stack Overflow Careers uh, web, uh, blog. Um, uh, the, the state of the workplace, uh, how pleasant is the workspace? This is something that I love to bring this up first because it seems like it is completely out of the range of a recruiter to change anything about the work environment. These are 10-year leases that were signed four years ago. We still got six years left on them. It was done not by the CEO or not by the CFO, but by some facilities manager that the process of finding a good workspace was delegated to because it was not thought of as being important. And the only person this should be important to is the recruiting department. These are the, these are the only people that should be standing up and screaming every time there's a new lease to be signed or they're trying to hire an architect or you're trying to decide how to organize the physical <laughs> workspace because that is what the programmers see when they come and interview. And that is where they're going to be spending their entire daylight hours. And that's, what, that's sort of the first impression that they get um, from the organization. So having a nice office with whatever it is, this is our coffee uh, bar in the Stack Overflow office, um, giving them the right equipment to work with. This doesn't even require a good office, but just giving them big screen monitors and laptops and two monitors if they need it, or four or six, whatever they ask for. Um, uh, a lot of the stuff is just how you manage the programmers, giving them some independence, the ability to work on things in the order that they want to work on to, to, to use their, their own brains and not to be micromanaged on a daily basis. Um, uh, you know, I still hear of people that have jobs where they're expected to be at work at 8.30 or 9 and, and to have a certain dress code, and that's beyond absurd. Um, makes absolutely no sense to me unless they're also models. Um, the quality of engineering work is really, really important to the good programmers. They don't want to work for a company that has shoddy engineering practices because it's just painful to be an engineer in an organization that has shoddy engineering practices. So um, some of those things are summarized in a blog post that I wrote called The Joel Test. So if you search for Joel Test on Google, you'll find it. And it's a list of 12 things that are a very, very quick way to rate your organization on how good, uh, you know, how good it's doing on engineering quality. And it's not like some big complicated IEEE standardized thing where you spend six months and you hire consultants and they tell you that you have an 82.6, but if you pay the consultants another $500,000, you might get all the way up to a 93. Um, this is just a 12 question test that everybody in your engineering organization will be able to answer yes or no and you get a score from 0 through 12 and the higher it is, the higher your engineering quality is. It's really simple. It's really easy. So some of these things I'll mention here, having a spec first, i.e. writing some kind of documentation. It can be written, it can be on the wall, it can be pictures, but some kind of design of what you're going to build before you build it. A lot of organizations don't do this. Um, having a schedule, this is very easy. I tell programmers when you're going out on interviews, at the end of the interview, when they say, do you have any questions for me? Then say, can I see the schedule for your current product? And if they say, what's the schedule? Then you don't want to work there. Because it's going to be miserable, because you're always going to be staying up until midnight trying to make up for the fact that the boss had a very different idea as to when this would be done than the team. Um, version control is an obvious thing. These are sort of basic tools. Using version control is like going and checking sure that your doctor understands what germs are and, and, and washes her hands. Uh, engineering quality, um, uh, one step build. Um, that essentially says that every, everything that it takes from writing new code, if I have just written some new code, then it should only take one step to get that code deployed out in the world and being used. It shouldn't be a five step process where I follow five sets of instructions because if it was a five step process, I should have scripted that. I should have written a program for that because I'm a programmer for God's sake. Because why make a mistake in the same five things that you do 23 times a day? If you go to an engineering, an engineering organization and you discover that they're following the same five steps manually 12 times a day, then they must not know how to code. I mean, they must not be real programmers. Um, this is a hard one. Product companies, a lot of engineers, sorry, did you have a question? Oh, you're telling me I have five minutes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I want 
10. No, just <laughs> um, a lot of engineers like product companies. Uh, uh, product, a product company basically says, if I'm an engineer, I want to work for a company where the engineering itself is the thing that we produce. Because then I'll be important to that company. If the thing that we produce is something else, if I'm, if I'm producing accounting software, I could go work for, um, I don't know, a tractor company. But the accounting software is sort of a byproduct. It's considered a cost center. It's not that glamorous. If I want to produce accounting software, I could be doing the same day-to-day -day job of writing accounting software. If I work for an accounting company, if I work for Intuit or NetSuite or some company that makes accounting software, then what I'm doing is really, really important to that business, and I'm going to be valued. And I'm going to get the nice offices and the, and the top floor and the corner offices and whatever. Um, creative work. I like to, people like to work on stuff where they have some control over what they're doing. It's not strictly mandated. Um, there's a whole bunch of sort of sympathetic things like do, do, do you identify with a company's goals? Maybe you're kind of into the environment or you're into education. Then as a programmer, you're going to want to work for the environmental company or the educational company, respectively. And that's a part of the idea that says think of... When you, when you recruit, you have to figure out what the core values of your company are, and are there people that you can recruit that share those values already, because they're going to be much easier to get to come and work for you. Identifying with the company's products is a variation on that. Apple has a lot of very easy time recruiting people to work at menial jobs in their retail stores, because everybody loves Apple computers. Um, Developers want to work for smart organizations, for learning organizations. One of the number one things that they'll tell you is that they want to learn more on the job. So how do you figure that out? That is something, as a recruiter, you could be spending some time on. If you feel like the, peop the developers in your organization don't spend enough time going, you know, getting new lectures, learning new programming languages, and learning new technologies, then that is something you have to institute, because nobody else will do it if it hasn't been done yet. Um, I, I code during an interview, I tell programmers, look for uh, jobs where you're required to write code during an interview. That's already considered sort of best practice. But if you're not asked to write code during an interview, then you can be certain that you will be working with people. When you take this job, you'll be working with people that actually don't know how to code, and that's going to be painful for you because you're going to have to make up for it. Uh, people like reporting to programmers. Programmers like it when their boss is a programmer, or uh, at the very least, a good manager in some way. And so making sure that the people that are doing management are, are skilled um, is really important. High quality team, that seems like it goes without saying. But the question is, what do you do if you have a low quality team and you're still trying to recruit new, new high quality people to it? And then the only solution I have for people is to try to segregate and create a little team of high quality people and hire into that and keep the other low quality people sort of out or make, make a little elite. It's, it's not a very nice thing to do. Um, <laughs> but it's not my fault. I didn't hire those people. You did. OK. <laughs> 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 Um, growth and learning, sort of the number one thing uh, for programmers. They want to know that this is a job where they can grow and they can learn. Um, this is the Joel test, which I encourage you all to uh, um, go Google. Um, these are sort of 12 things that programmers are going around asking. And you'll discover this, and you'll find that on our job board, we, require, we ask you to answer um, these kind of questions. And it's very, very simple things that, again, just a quick little, can we figure this out in three minutes? Do we have high quality? Is this a good place to get a job? or not. And that's the stuff that you need to take back internally to your organization and make sure that they do it, because that'll get gravity working for you. Last thing, and I can do this pretty quickly, because it's just a bunch of pictures of Google offices. Um, my rabbi is, uh, is Seth Godin. The person I learned from the most is Seth Godin. He's uh, kind of a marketing guy. Some of you may have seen his books. He always talks about making things remarkable. And he goes back to the origin of the word remarkable. Remarkable is this is something that you might talk about. And when you see it, you're going to remark on it. You're going to talk to the person you're standing next to, and you're going to go home. You're going to tell your significant other, you know what I saw at the Zurich office in Google? They have um, a, a pole that you use to slide down from the third floor to the second floor when you want to go to lunch. Or they have um, surfboards hanging up all over the place, and they have these cool little loungy chairs where you can take naps, and they have ridiculous lunch, and they have these cool little meeting rooms that are architecturally interesting. And one of their meeting rooms looks like a library. I think that's wallpaper, actually. I don't know if those are real books. And, um, and, and they have hammocks that you can sit in and code with your laptop. And, and everything is, there's a nice espresso bar, and there's bright, colorful stuff. And I could just go in the game room and all this kind of stuff. You've heard this and all, and it drives you crazy, because a lot of you probably have been told that you cannot purchase a foosball table or whatever. Um, but all of this stuff, look how much they have. God, I could just go on and on. Um, this is just one, one office. This is Zurich. Uh, London has about uh, as much stuff. Um, and the New York office and the Mountain View office also have all this amazing stuff that you want to talk about. And it's almost like they put it there just to get people telling stories. And the end result, 
And I don't have to tell you that Google is good at recruiting, but the end result is that the marketing budget, I was just told this by the head of recruiting marketing at Google, for Google is now zero. They have stopped all marketing for recruiting. They spend nothing, zero, on this. They still, they pay their LinkedIn bills. I don't know why, they seem to be unhappy about that. But, um, <laughs> but they actually spend no money on active marketing because they don't need to because everybody in the world wants to work for Google because there was this awesome movie, even before the movie. Um, you know, there was this huge gravitational force because they made the environment a little bit exceptional, a little bit crazy, and they spend about 10% more on their offices and their environment and the work quality and the quality of the people that are working there, and they got all these things right, and they fixed all these things, and, and like I say, the only problem Google has now is trying to decide which of those people that are applying, which is everybody, uh, they want working for them. Thank you very much. <laughs>